Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we're excited to interview biophiliac and artist Chris Ritson. Chris was raised on the Hawaiian island of Oahu and still lives and works there today above Honolulu on Mount Tantalus. He is an artist whose practice is informed by society's relationship to nature. And the art ranges from video and installation to living generative sculpture. He studied new genres at the San Francisco Art Institute and has since exhibited internationally. To Chris, art is a process initiated to produce phenomena which impacts the viewer with a novel perspective. In his view, this process must account for all aspects leading to the manifestation of the artwork and only by weighing the environmental, social, and economic impacts necessary for that art's creation can the intent of the creator be considered. He places value on natural systems and mankind's ability to integrate positively with them. His art is based around growing generative aesthetics by employing chemical or biological processes with the goal of creating regenerative impacts on the environment. By examining the anxiety that is triggered by our society's strained relationship with nature, Chris hopes to expose new methodologies of material and artistic production informed by biological generative aesthetics. Now truly, his practice in creating art is indeed generative, unique, inspiring, as he grows crystals, algae, and mushrooms into pieces that quite literally take on a life of their own. Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, thank you for having me. Well, it's a big honor for me. I've been a fan of your art for a long time. I think anyone who's followed you on social media or on Instagram sees your art, and the number one question you come away with is, how is he doing that? It seems like there's some kind of magic involved with cr growing crystals and, and mushrooms into sculpture. So I'm excited to learn more about it. Oh, great. Thank you. As we kind of learn more about your art, I do like to start with a little snapshot, a brief origin of Chris, just to hear about your background and maybe how that influenced where you are today. So between, you know, family, education, were there influences in your life, maybe mentors, people that gave you an appreciation for these generative natural principles or an appreciation for art? Yeah, well, growing up in Hawaii definitely gives you a novel perspective, I think. And I feel really grateful for being able to have that. My family lived near the ocean, so I wasn't super exposed to mushrooms until later. Uh, we're definitely ocean people. I grew up scuba diving and spearfishing and kayaking and surfing really regularly and that all gave me a sort of obsession with the outdoor world. You know, it's incredible, not just place of recreation, but sort of environment that can totally change the way you see things and experience things. So I do appreciate the role my family played in that and growing up and my friends being in Hawaii too. But also I did want to leave dramatically and I got to see parts of the mainland, California, New York, that, I think coming back to Hawaii really informed me as well. I did start studying sciences and biotech at the University of Hawaii and was engaged in a shrimp farming operation, Okay, uh, which was really, really cool. The fellow's name was Yasuhiko, and we were importing a new shrimp from Japan after decades of uh, trying to get permits to do it. Um, it really blew my mind how a organism can have so much resource. You can bring on the airplane, you know, 20 little baby shrimp and create a whole legacy for future farmers to use. But I found myself gravitating towards philosophy and art classes and ended up trying to take that path, which I moved to San Francisco and got to study at the Art Institute there. Uh, I was enrolled in a new genres program, which basically focuses on more contemporary postmodern practices and theories and really rich history art history background too in that so came back to hawaii pretty soon and i've been here for 12 years now back home when you went to san francisco to study art 
Was there anyone who was really influential in your process of becoming an artist? Obviously, we're hearing about the inspirations you're getting from living on Hawaii, your inspirations from nature. But was there any person or maybe artist that you looked up to that was doing work that really informed your own journey uh, getting into art? Oh man, that's hard to choose somebody. Um, you know, it was it was <laughs> or, a really many people. Yeah, I mean, the community of San Francisco at the time I was there was so different from anything I'd experienced in Hawaii. Uh, there's so many people there just trying to live very expressive, creative lifestyles, and whether that was in a music scene or an art scene or just any sort of social scene there, saw people experimenting with really alternative. Uh, ways of integrating with society. I saw a lot of really negative aspects of that, but also I think being able to take away those experiences really helped me to look outside of systems that were perhaps opp oppressing us in the art world, uh, colonial aspects of society, and lots of qualities that kind of hard to notice unless you know where to look. Yeah, yeah. that's that's something unique. I don't hear a lot of artists talk about is the actual impact you are having as an artist who creates art. You know, it's one thing to illustrate some of the ways that human society impacts nature and try to highlight that. But I think you add this other cognizance of how the artist in creating the art is also impacting nature, which I think is interesting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like that is a tenet of contemporary art is that we're supposed to look outside of the gallery and account for more uh, richer nature of the art itself. But I'm constantly confronted with painters who are, you know, showing me what they're representing. What I often see is, you know, a representation of an idea, but the way it's expressed is through, you know, something like acrylic paint petroleum products and we think about how does that get to the artist where does that come from and what does it mean to be relying on those sort of systems those global systems uh, to create a representation of something so i do think an important thing is getting that stuff out in the real world and accounting for that as we should with everything we do i think it's very clear in our world right now that we haven't been paying enough attention to the impacts we have on the environment. Yeah, it's a level of awareness and self-responsibility to really hold yourself accountable. And I think your work kind of does focus obviously on regenerative uh, materials when you make your art so that ethos shines through. Another thing I noticed in reading some of your bio information is you refer to art as kind of a process or a practice whereas some people refer to it as work. I mean, before I ascribe a lot of significance to it, is there any significance in you calling art, you know, a process or a practice or what does that mean to you? Yeah, absolutely. As to what I was speaking to earlier, I think when we just observe work in an isolated environment, be it a museum or gallery, we're losing the richness of what accounts for its creation. We're putting too much emphasis on the perspective of the artist which really isn't there. I mean, we are all are products of the influence we've had growing up, the world we live in, the physical, corporeal reality of what we were embedded in when we made that art. Right. And so I think, you know, that's accounted for in art history a lot, but for the most part now, we, we're still very reliant on these institutions that really isolate art and make us think of what it is un, into itself, you know, separated from the world. That's a big concept. And I have to, I have to say, I don't know that a lot of people see any kind of work, but especially artwork in the greater context of, of the society that they are in when they're actually making, it's hard to have that level of perspective in the current moment to kind of see how your work or whatever you're putting out into the world is generating out of this bigger society with much bigger themes at play. Uh, so I think that level of cognizance really, really is something that, that I find to be unique. I think a lot of what we're talking about is getting to why your work is highlighting nature and is focused on kind of these organic elements because you are seeing yourself in the context of a society that is not in great harmony with nature. 
um, whether it be through materials artists are using and so many other things. So when did that start? Because it's one thing to have that big awareness of the context in which you're creating your art, but then it's another thing to really hold yourself accountable and decide to make art that is more based in nature or is more based around organic matter. Like I said in the introduction, I mean, you're working with crystals, algae, mushrooms. You know, when did you make flip that switch to say, okay, if I'm going to really make art that's true to me and is true to my understanding of what we're doing here, I need to use biomaterials, basically. I think for me, an art practice has always been about trying to create work that helps us explore, understand our experience, the self, who we are, and what that means in its nature being embedded in things that are outside of the self. And what is that definition? What is that distinction? So I started looking at the human body originally, the way it's being represented. Uh, I was making massive sculptures out of magazines and cutting just the, the human body parts out and creating big monsters and animals out of them and just using these sort of strange, surreal, physical representations we're used to, the sort of grotesque, animalistic structures. But I found pretty quickly that in order to really explore the self, we need to look outside of it into the things we define as not the self, as the other. And I started with crystals. I started with generative things that could make their own because there's this uncanny quality in them where we see something replicating that's not human. Uh, that has a mind of its own, perhaps we'd say. And yeah. That does trigger a sort of anxiety in us. Anything that's not us needs to be reconciled in a way. And in a way, all art is kind of doing that. It's looking to find the sublime. It's looking to take you outside of yourself and give you a meaningful experience. And so I think by relying on self-generating materials, mostly living, but the crystals being unliving, but that's kind of debatable. Uh, I can get people to, and myself, to open up to explore these qualities of what being person and experiencing your own reality really mean. Yeah. And another thought I had here was, does our current relationship, you know, human beings, current relationship in modern society and our inclination to try to control nature, uh, do you think that might trigger some anxiety too when you're seeing like you said, you're trying to reconcile art. You're trying to, but that idea of you're seeing something natural growing, and like we all have this maybe perverse instinct at this point to try to control nature in some way. Do you think that adds maybe to that feeling of anxiety when people see generative art like that? Yeah, I think so. And I think just the idea that we think about our notions of beauty and aesthetics as being taught, not inherent. Look at music, you know, a minor chord can be sad in one culture and happy in another. These are things we've all learned to experience the way we see beauty in fine art. But also just the nature of how we produce, how we do control and define nature. And, you know, empirical sciences, as important and where they've gotten us, still can't objectively comprehend things like consciousness. So, yeah, we have a long way to go, but we do completely live in this world defined by control and by understanding how to use and rely on things outside of us. But, you know, clearly the body is not who we are. The body is not just a single organism. It's, it's a much more complex thing than that. Something as complex uh, as nature, as the generative principle that kind of unites all things, whether it's a human body or almost anything we see in the universe, whether living or non-living, there does seem to be this syntropic or generative principle to come face to face with that. Sometimes you can't always intellectually understand it. So experiencing it in something like art may be one of the best ways to really know it or to really experience it on some level rather than trying to, to intellectually understand the, the raw nature and even sometimes the chaos of that kind of generative principle. Uh, so that that's at least what I think of when when I see your work. Now, you just mentioned crystals, and that was actually some of your work. I got keyed into your work with mushrooms. So I actually didn't know about your crystal work until I got 
a little bit deeper and uh, saw some of that work. So when we talk about growing crystals, what does that mean? And you know what? Let's let's go with it. Do you think crystals are something that is quote unquote alive? Well, I think that distinction is hard to tell, but I, I do think a very popular theory is that DNA came from crystals. It came from crystals and clay and slight wow. evolution of that is the only way to account for DNA and the evolution of life on our planet. Unless you believe in aliens, I guess, but uh, <laughs> I love that and, theory. I love to think yeah. that DNA came from crystals and clay. Yeah. Well, so as I was using them, I was trying to create sculptures that would grow in a place and that, you know, you could walk in one day and walk in another day, or even within some of them I had within hours, they would, were changing, but something that changes and grows on its own without having distinct living quality is really startling. I think I was really attracted to it because I could use organic materials. I was using sugars specifically for a while and, you know, sugar has a really rich history in Hawaii. It historically was the way the kingdom was overthrown by uh, the sugar industry. Uh, it has reaped irrevocable environmental harm on the islands, diverted the waterways and, Generally, since it's pulled out, left most of the islands, agricultural areas and disuse, and just covered in weeds now. But that was my draw to it, I think, and was to try to make something that wasn't computerized or wasn't just logical, create its own sort of artwork. I did explore that to try to find more archival things, things that I could sell or ship around. And I did start using a material called bismuth. It's a elemental metal, a heavy metal, close to lead. But when you crystallize it, it forms these incredible uh, cube within cube structures and rainbow colored oxidation on them. It absolutely does not look like any MC Escher sort of thing. It doesn't look like anything in the natural world. That's the work I was looking at your website that was just inspiring such awe into me. So that was actually the crystallization of bismuth. And I guess that process of crystallization, whether it be sugar, bismuth, I guess the best you can explain it, what does that mean? How do you turn these into these beautiful crystalline structures? Is it some kind of, I mean, it can't be food because we're not talking about things that are alive. So how are you making it form these amazing structures? Well, crystallization is the structure, the atomic structure of an element or a chemical. Mm. So imagine the way the atoms are shaped. They all have a specific, they connect a specific way right. and amplify that, you know, to a degree that we can see it. And that's the same shape as a crystal. So that's another thing it does that makes it very uncanny is it represents an elemental truth, something we can't even comprehend. that's so small and makes it physical. It makes it something we can experience. Mostly this is done by, the way I was doing it is done by a method called supersaturation, where you take the chemical or the metal or the crystal and change its state so uh, it can absorb more. For instance, the sugar is dissolved in water and heated up. The hotter the water goes, the more it can absorb. Mm -hmm. so you get it very hot. You get as much sugar as you can absorb in it. And then as it cools, that sugar precipitates and will form crystals. The way you cool it, the timing, the intervals, and how it's exposed to the air changes the shape of the crystals a lot. In order to get big, chunky ones, it does take quite a lot of precision, I have to say. But that's basically it. With the metal, it's the same thing. You, you shift it from a molten state to a solid state in certain parts of the solution. So sort of like you add a catalyst as that's happening, a small crystal, and it will build off of that. You know, it's funny, I'm reminded of writings about alchemy, and that idea of changing states of things, but also that idea of manifesting that principle that the universe is cross similar or across scales, or that, you know, as above, so below. So I love that reference you said about making that atomic structure manifest outwards. That's kind of a really powerful thing and probably something that would have gotten you into those early alchemical societies, Chris. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very inspired by uh, the nature of alchemy in Western society. It is. Uh, it's also a lot of alchemists, though, think about Faust. They're tempted by the devil. They're on the sort of 
fringe of whether they're acceptable or not. And often they are seen outside of religious institutions. So there is a subversive quality to that. And I think that does rise from that anxiety I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Subversive element of society wanting to just bring forth this unrestrained generative principle would definitely cause some uh, cause some anxiety <laughs> in the existing the existing systems and control systems. This sounds like kind of where these generative sculptures started. So what were people's reception of these works and how did that inspire you to move on to some of your other works in, in algae and mushrooms? Yeah, well, I was primarily concerned or working with that when I was on the mainland. And oh, okay. I lived in California for a little bit and I lived in New York for a little bit. And it was relatively easy to do the small projects I was doing, which for the most part were proposals for large life-size things and never really got realized. But uh, with the bismuth, I was working with porcelain figurines that were neoclassical sort of impression. Figurines like classical women and men and uh, growing them off the heads because that's the way a chemi the chemical reaction would have been done in a laboratory anyway. You would stick a sort of catalyst in there and grow it off the tip of it playing with that idea of what it is to be human again and the human self kind of integrating that with this unrestrained creative principle of the crystallization growing in its own form i think of that theme of breaking open the head really interesting now none of the bigger forms got realized uh the biggest pieces i was making was still in my lab so nothing yeah. over you know 12 or 18 inches but that edition did get picked up and was funded by the app VSCO. They commissioned a whole edition of those figurines uh, as a photo set. So uh, I did get some support in creating those. Uh, bismuth is quite expensive, <laughs> but <laughs> that was very cool. And they were, it was a nice practice because those were, those were very sellable, you know, they last, they're pretty fragile, but they were popular. I liked those. Well, the artist does have to, consider the societal circumstances he's in and ours is driven by money so it's nice to have something you could sell but you, and you may have just gotten to the heart of this with saying bismuth is expensive but i wondered how they could scale up to like some 40 foot sculpture of you think a burning man or something with this giant sculpture of a person with huge crystals and bismuth growing out of its head i i think we should fund that immediately <laughs> yeah it's pretty cool it's really cool stuff. It's so simple to compared to some of the other chemicals I was working with. It just needs heat. It is a heavy metal though. So there's quite mm. a lot that goes into most of the bismuth I was getting was being extracted in places like Brazil. I'm sure under less than ideal circumstances uh, for the people working with it. And the effects it has on the people working with it isn't clearly understood. It is what Pepto-Bismol gets its name from. It's bismuth salts, but I particularly was a little concerned about working with it or making it my day-to-day -day experience. So yeah, I think I did look from there onto more sustainable materials as I found that was something I wanted to concern myself with. Well, and then I saw your work with algae and it really brought a lot of questions into my head of what, I mean, all your work does this, but what is art? Can populations of algae in and of themselves have an inherent beauty that is art, whether or not you ascribe that to it or not, or whether or not someone defines it as art or not, are some of these life forms so beautiful in their form that just creating an environment for them to live is art? And I definitely think so. What were the pieces you were making uh, with algae? Because that's such an interesting material to use in art. Yeah, that one was really fun. That was commissioned by the Honolulu Biennial. It was mm. one of the first major international exhibits that had been hosted in Hawaii. And it was a response to what's going on in Hawaii a lot. We're very experienced. We're very involved in the problems we're having with the coral reefs, bleaching and runoff, algae is taking over. So I worked with a sort of algae that actually deposits a coralline uh, skeleton. And when we think about coral reefs, we talk about the corals, but the whole foundation and what the corals actually chemically respond on to grow is built from this coralline algae. It will be, you know, 
yards or you know tens of 20 feet thick uh, these huge structures so it's also affected perhaps even more by ocean acidification mm. so i had proposed to create a system that could be shown in the space that was actively culturing this coralline algae on a uh, two-dimensional plane but culturing it under really specific environment. So instead of just having it be an aquarium growing this algae, it was adjusted to express the sort of chemistry the ocean might experience in 50 or 100 years, lower pH, higher temperature. So within this structure, the algae was self-selecting and the ones growing perhaps had a better chance of surviving the future. Mm. I, not being a formal scientist, couldn't really use this, but the idea was to create a work that by creating the art, you're also having a positive effect. You're learning about how to mitigate these problems we're going to be facing very soon. And also, the products I created, they were plastic panels immersed in these aquariums. They were removable, they were dried, and the skeletons remained. And they were then archival objects that could be sold, presented as an artifact of that experiment. And they looked pretty cool. I was pretty happy with the way they came out. I would imagine coral reefs are one of those things that anyone who is a biophile can't help but be amazed by the structures and shapes. And it really does probably a lot of the time start with that underlying skeleton. And I actually didn't know that it, that skeleton was, is it a byproduct of the algae's processes that eventually leave those deposits? Yeah, it looks a lot okay. like lichen. It kind of grows, oh. uh, most of the kind I was using is a calcareous one. It grows in flat discs, sort of. Uh, it looks like a mycelium or an, an algae. And uh, they, they grow in low light situations, uh, and it does. It deposits on and on itself, but it's only you know a millimeter or so thick. Yeah. It's very yeah. slow growing, but higher magnesium content than coral, so it is more susceptible to ocean acidification. Wow, and so your experiment, did you find that with your, uh, let's say, projected ocean environment, given the, the trends that maybe we're on right now, you said you weren't a scientist, so maybe there is no baseline to compare it to, but did it come out in the way you expected? Was the actual coral structure somehow deteriorated or in some way you could tell, yeah, this isn't as healthy and we're seeing that the algae can't grow in this environment? Did it kind of bear itself out like that? Yeah, well, it was half and half. The system was inoculated by garbage I'd collected, mostly glass bottles. And, okay. uh, things that had been in the ocean and had been encrusted in this algae. So it was in its own chamber in a system. The stuff spreads kind of by spores. Uh, so from that chamber, it would move up into the panels. But yeah, certainly certain strains on the originals died out, but other ones did definitely grow on the uh, panels. I mean, I can't even identify the, the different species of those ones. That was very new to me. But yeah. In Hawaii, there are very popular research organizations that are doing similar things with corals, and creating what they're calling super corals. And then by breeding and creating these corals that are more likely to survive, they're then releasing them to the environments. So I am very inspired by what people are doing tangibly in, in the ocean and in our world here in Hawaii. Yeah, well, and it sounds like you were illustrating that work in your work that idea of selecting for maybe for lack of a better term more durable algae or algae that could support some of these changing environments and honestly when i hear that it does give me give me a little piece of hope uh, because anyone who's seen uh, that movie chasing coral or has just done any research into this topic knows that this bleaching of the coral and the effects right now that that the coral reefs are experiencing due to changes in the ocean are, I mean, they're horrifying. So to see in your work that there is an ability for algae to self-select, that there is this potential for different strains to emerge that are able to hold up and maybe adapt, that, that gives a lot of hope. Obviously, the better solution is to not ruin the ocean, but to think these life forms can continue and continue to thrive and adapt is is hope inspiring yeah well in some regard hopefully 
you know, Hawaii has got a long history of all of our native endemic organisms uh, going extinct and being replaced by alien organisms from across the world that are more adapted to be competitive, you know. Right. So whether or not it's a good thing, it's hard to know. We will leave, lose a lot of biodiversity in the best case scenario. It's like domestication. I think with these wild species, we can gain a lot by integrating our lives with them and uh, having a relationship with these things that we kind of overlook. Yeah, absolutely. Now, did you have any overlap at all in doing that work with some of those organizations that were doing similar research or did that ever get connected in some way? Not specifically, no. But I have visited those laboratories and I've met people working with it and have the utmost respect for what they're doing. But no, I mean, I guess in an in a ideal world, that whole experience would be financed and involve people who are using this stuff. Even if scientists did have a way to sell objects you know, to the public. So you have to question what people are funding when they fund art, I think, sometimes. And, uh, relationship you have with collectors i want them to question you know what they're collecting and why they're collecting it and why those resources are going there right right man always hyper conscious and aware of of the structure of the system that's holding up all the activities or all the things we put our time and attention to and it's interesting to hear you talk about algae as kind of similar to mushrooms i mean the reference to mycelium the reference to spores and the fact that you had to inoculate the tank with things that were exposed to algae, uh, there's there's a lot of similarity there. And algae and mushrooms do form lichen in that kind of mutually symbiotic relationship they've had for so many thousands, probably millions of years. A great thing to highlight as we move into mushrooms, uh, mm -hmm. because now a lot of your work that I see and am absolutely amazed by is your work in creating living mushroom art how did you decide to get into that where were you exposed to mushrooms how did you decide you were going to start growing these amazing pieces of mushroom art i don't know i've always been really really interested in mushrooms and we have a pretty diverse collection of them growing wild in hawaii that's yeah. very different from mainland not nearly as many edible species a lot of strange tropical things that just look very very alien uh, and since being young, I've always just been really fascinated with these really strange things you come across in the forest. I really got into growing them after I moved home. We live up in the mountains, my wife and I, and it's quite a wild environment. Uh, very wet rainforest, very, very diverse trees from all over the world growing here. So the uh, amount of strange very strange tropical mushrooms from the Philippines and South America, India, just all over here. There's a really interesting history and amount of strains we can experience here. So, gosh, I started growing things like turkey tail and reishi. The reishi I acquired a culture for, but very soon, I mean, I, I grow plants. I have a flower farm on the side. I'm really into propagating things. I figured out how to propagate these wild ones completely just fascinated there's nothing quite like it they grow so fast so satisfying and the more i get into the actual relationship mushrooms have with the environment and with people the more i just was completely consumed by how cool it was has your relationship with mushrooms and algae too but your relationship with these living things deepened because you are working with them day to day, you are creating artwork. I mean, do you feel more connected with mushrooms than say a lay person who just knows they're interesting? I, I would imagine that you'd have some kind of like deep intimate connection with the spirit of the mycelium and the mushroom when you're working with them as, as much as you do. And, and in such an intimate way, not just to grow and eat necessarily, but to grow and really like experience the mushroom from an aesthetic angle from kind of every dimension. So how is, how is that deepened your relationship with the mushroom? Oh, wow. The mushroom has been such an influential organism and such an influential kingdom, right? Yeah. There's so little I knew about it, even though I was, I've been fascinated with them my whole life. There's so much to learn. They're just so different than 
plants or humans or animals or anything like that I'd really come across. I started with edible ones and, you know, medicinal ones I was really interested in, but you start approaching them specifically for material or aesthetic considerations. It was really, really wonderful. And working with ones that I want to express things that we can just respond to as beautiful without having to think about it, without having to think about how I drew it or what I drew has been really, really wonderful. But also I collect mushrooms that are literally from the environment I'm in, literally the, the property I'm on for the most part. And wow. yeah, the way they grow and respond to the environment is really specific too. Uh, when they decide to fruit, you know, what materials they're growing on, it's all very site specific. And I think that helps for the integrity of the art a lot. The fact that you can draw them from the art itself is of that land, both in the fact that you're creating it, but also that you're drawing the resources from right there. And that actually got to the heart of a number of questions I had. I guess you probably had to develop then some skills in the lab. You know, you had to get some mycology skills if you're going to culture out wild specimens. So maybe where did you acquire that skill, those skills? Do you have a lab on your property or at your house? Maybe a little bit about your relationship with mycology as a, as a practice, as a science. Well, I started learning about lab procedures and mushroom cultivation through the internet. I feel so fortunate within the last maybe decade or two, there's been such a rich community of people who've taken online to figure out how to grow mushrooms in their house with incredibly simple ingredients. And a lot of this was fueled, I think, by illicit psychedelic mushroom growth. For better or worse, it created sort of protocols that you can get the materials at Walmart, you know, and grow what before that would have required a laboratory, a sterile space, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment. So that I thought was really liberating. And I was studying communities on the internet that were using, uh, you know, their communal aspect to make more direct connections with their environments. So I started with very simple procedures uh, using still air boxes and pasteurized wood chips. It was really hard. Uh, it, it's a very, very contaminant filled environment I live in. There is mold thick in the walls everywhere. The house is over a hundred years old and we are literally in a cloud forest. Uh, so it took a long time to understand how that worked, but I still work with really simple procedures. Uh, I've recently built myself my first laminar flow hood. I had been fruiting things in a small cement room and then moving them out to finalize outside, actually. The large pieces had an area next to a small stream surrounded by plants that I really think helped with the oxygen exchange. Things are very simple with what I'm working with, and I do hope to expand. And learning more is such a technique, and it's just like being a painter or something. There is a very, very defined physical technique to doing this stuff. And been really interesting learning that. Yeah, and it's just such a new perspective to think of lab skills and these mycology protocols as part of the process of creating art. You know, I often think that science and art are intertwined in so many ways, and in your case, they are uh, inexorably linked in the creation of your artwork is this process and application of science. And you're right, there is an explosion of this information online right now. So I love the fact that you were able to open source a lot of these skills and that you are able to create something that is so impactful and so awe-inspiring. Um, if folks have seen your work, it is really amazing to see these big fruit bodies emerging from a nice framed, uh, what I would imagine is a piece of substrate. But the fact you're able to manifest that without the perfect environment, with a still air box. I'm sure you've had your contamination issues and everything else, but it speaks to the massive potential there is with mycology and the eminent approachability of it, and probably has a lot to do with the fact these organisms are robust and almost more than any other, they want to grow. They want to exponentially expand their biomass and they are extremely efficient at it. But I guess, 
what is your relationship with mushrooms even beyond the art? Do you go, I mean, did you go foraging? Do you take medicinal mushrooms? Do you have a relationship with the mushroom beyond just making the art? Yeah, well, I definitely am interested in foraging. Uh, like I said, though, there aren't the most uh, delicious mushrooms in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. On my island, it's mostly jelly fungus and, you know, wood ears. On the other islands, though, there are the occasional oysters. Uh, what else? Chicken of the woods you'll find occasionally. And there's even morels occasionally found in wow. pretty sparing numbers in Hawaii. But uh, we also have some pathogen. We have a organism called rat lungworm, which is carried by slugs, which really like mushrooms here, which will actually create little worms that burrow into your brain. So I've been a lot less interested in foraging in the past, I don't know, it's just been like five or 10 years since that's been taking off. Since rat lung worm. Oh my, I had never heard of that. And I was just about to say it must be a dream foraging in Hawaii, but no, it might be a nightmare. Yeah. You get no. rat lung worm. Any raw slug, if you happen to eat a raw slug, uh, which has been happening to people mostly with like salad greens and things like that. Uh, uh, okay. There's a very small community though in Hawaii. There's one single guidebook. It's been out, I think, since the 80s. I am seeing communities grow on Facebook and things like that for Hawaii mycology, and people are becoming very interested in uh, mycology, I assume everywhere, but we're seeing a bunch of new farms have just popped up in Hawaii, and uh, a couple of medicinal companies have now popped up too, so I think there's a lot of potential. We have really diverse environments here, so we can grow tropical ones, but also in the higher uh, altitudes, people are growing mainland mushrooms like heraculums and blue oysters and stuff like that. So there's just a lot we can do here. Yeah. In looking at Hawaii's kind of mycological sphere, it's a really interesting combination because you guys get so much tourism. I'd imagine you have a lot of invasive species from spores coming in on people's clothing from the mainland. Like you said, maybe outcompete some of the endemic fungi that aren't as adaptable. Yeah, it's really hard to know, I think, because there isn't a good history for pre-contact in Hawaii, what the mushrooms were. And there are some researchers who are trying to look back at Hawaiian language and Hawaiian culture, and there, there were quite a few mushrooms here, but it's such a hard thing to definitively know whether or not things are coming in commercially or invasively. In my my lifetime here, there's been one species that has come in and seems to be debatable whether or not it's invasive but everything i think has come in way before tourism when people were importing things for agriculture i feel like there should be a lot more introduced species but so many are so particular to the types of woods they've been growing on but you know each island has totally different things and you know there's amanitas on some of the islands there's turkey tail on some of the island which is crazy to think that they don't uh, switch islands you know we're not that far away it's funny because you get an island environment like that, and if the research continues and kind of the mycological explosion you're talking about continues, I'm sure we can learn a lot about the properties of different fungi and the potential evolutionary patterns just from seeing how they spread or don't spread from island to island. You know, anytime you get any kind of island environment, you get such a good petri dish to look at an organism and, and its properties and get hints about its history. So hopefully we will see the continued mycological exploration there. And one interesting other element of this is Hawaii is newer land geologically than almost anywhere on the planet. Uh, you think of, you know, the land being created literally from magma that's solidifying and over time creating land. So it's much newer than a lot of other places. So we may be seeing the infancy or, or at least earlier stages of mushroom and populations. But I am really impressed that you were able to find species for your art, I mean, right where you live. And so the main species you use for your art are turkey tails and reishi. Are there any other species that find their way into, or any other you've experimented with in making your art? Yeah, I haven't actually used the reishi, the, any other gamma, ganoderma for art. But okay. uh, the main species I'm using, I do have a turkey tail strain that came from Kauai up in Kokei. 
that has been really, really aggressive. I like that one a lot. But more recently, my favorite one has been uh, Michael Porus of Venice. And it looks a lot like turkey tail, but is larger and much smoother and has brighter colors. It has almost greens and blues and oranges. Yeah. And they're, they will grow in the forest in huge numbers. They're really, really amazing. I believe they're from Southeast Asia, but they are incredibly tough. Like just if you dry them the last three years, just the, co the color patterns are so dramatic. I've been using that one a lot. The other one I use is Pycnoporus. Sanguinis, it's a bright orange mushroom that I believe you can find on the mainland, but it does not discriminate on what it eats. It will eat anything, and it is so disease resistant. But it also, it's so brilliant, the color. That's one I really, really like using right now. But I've tried dozens of strains. I've tried so many different strains. I usually, I usually try to get polypores or things that have thick fruiting bodies, but these are the two, and, and within that, I've tried strains, different different uh, strains within those species. So, you know, after maybe ten different clones, I'll find one that works really well. The food you're using, I mean, you said some of these, like the Pictoporus, are eating anything, but what generally do you use as a substrate in your art pieces? Well, the aim with this was really to find like a closed circle process. So. What we're doing on this property, besides growing tropical flowers, is uh, native re reforestation. So it's something important to know about Hawaii, not only is it you know, this incredibly diverse new land, but it's the most isolated land in the world. So the things that got here before humans were incredibly special, and they evolved here without any big predators. All the trees who had thorns lost them, plants that were poisonous didn't need to be anymore. And I don't know, I think that has made for a really different environment now in Hawaii. And these things that have taken over are so aggressive and absolutely give the native things no chance to compete. So we've taken it upon ourselves to clear out some of these older trees that have been here for over 100 years from uh, invasive species like guavas or these other things from South America that will literally just choke them out. So we can either mulch, which we do mostly, these things we cut down, or ideally grow mushrooms off of them. So I'm trying to use these invasive trees that get cleared, grind them up, and have a nice product that hopefully can fund this uh, reforestation project. Always thinking about making the system as generative, maybe as regenerative as possible. You know, recently I've been trying to get over the word sustainable because I think a lot of times when we think about where we are as a planet, the point that we've stressed nature to at this point, sustainable almost isn't enough. You know, we do need to start thinking about how we can have a regenerative impact. And that's illustrated beautifully there in that idea where you're trying to keep the biodiversity of the native Hawaiian plants, reforest, take those invasive species, turn them into amazing mushrooms and art that then you sell to continue with your project in, in establishing that biodiversity of endemic or native Hawaiian plants. Uh, that really stands out to me as a regenerative process. It's inspiring to hear how that's coming up in your work and you're able to actually do that. Do you have advice for artists who maybe have a naturalist bent or maybe you're coming to grips with some of those aspects or realities of creating art that you came to grips with. Do you have any advice for people as to how to start navigating and maybe get more on the path you are where you're making art part of a greater regenerative process? I think the first thing I tell people is not to represent the problems, but to approach the problems. And I, I appreciate artists who have social bends and who are trying to educate people on uh, world issues that perhaps they see as important and are very important, but perhaps that would be a better role served by a journalist, you know, and the art artists should be there to not just offer a problem, but to serve a solution. I think that's really the sublime reconciliation people are looking for in good art, whether it's conceptual or physical, I really think it, 
we have to get away from representing problems, and representing ideas. I think it was Terrence McKenna who said the only way we're going to save ourselves is with is through artists. You know, it's going to take creators and artists who are going to show us creative solutions. Uh, so I, I like that. Maybe instead of focusing on highlighting the problem, let's figure out how to show or symbolize it, or, or maybe not even symbolize, but to actually implement a solution and showcase that as the art itself. Kind of staying in this broad vein, how do you think our societies in general can improve our relationship with nature, artists or not? I mean, what are some of the ways that you've come away with? Because I think you've done a study into these issues and into the ways that nature has been affected, the way that stress shows up, and have probably thought about a lot of ways that we can provide solutions or, you know, change our behavior and change what we do to, to help ease that stress and maybe bring things more back into balance. So what are some recommendations you might have in that vein? You know, is it, is it still possible to scale back and maybe let nature start healing itself? Well, I don't know if we can scale back. I think we have to participate. I mean, mushrooms help me address this so well because of the sort of relationship we have to them. And, you know, I tell people I grow mushrooms and they either say, oh, what kind of mushrooms? Or they <laughs> say, ew, gross. And I think mushrooms grow from dead things, you know? We have a sort of anxiety with them within themselves and it's like uh, that separation between living and dead is so that the same reconciliation that religion and art is trying to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. The way we are terrified at seeing a dead body because it makes us confront the inevitability of death. I think mushrooms can incorporate the deeper relationship death has and the ability for a process to overcome it and for us to bridge that gap between the self and the other. Yeah. Mushrooms are definitely function as that bridge, uh, ecologically. And I like that idea that symbolically they're showing this reconciliation, uh, that like you just, like you said, uh, that I think a lot of spiritualism tries to get you know, to the heart of, or a lot of institutionalized religion is basically wrestling with that idea of <laughs> reconciling eminent death and reconciling, you know, how we, how we continue living despite that. Uh, and I think mushrooms probably show it in the clearest way. Now have mushrooms, I mean, what is your spiritual practice or is the veneration of nature and the propagation of everything under the sun like you do, do you consider that your spiritual practice or do you have something more formal that you engage in or? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in spiritual practices and the only thing I formally involve myself in, I think is research. And mm -hmm. I've, I've been very grateful to experience, you know, academics in my educational career and, people in my life who will offer really novel perspectives, but uh, it does come down to integrating with nature for me and seeing that process outside of ourselves and trying to contemplate, you know, at what is the point that causes a seed to grow? You know, what is the energy making that mycelium on the, the Petri dish expand and trying to see beyond my body and myself into that world is the spiritual connection I think I would describe myself as having. And it's a spiritual practice I see represented in so many religions. You know, we, we take away the idea of a God being a personified character and being a force of nature. And it does really give you a deeper perspective in how to understand where we are and why we're here and who, what, what it actually means to be embedded in a body. Yeah, so you've engaged in your own incredible spiritual journey and exploring those concepts through this process of growing things and creating art and forming an intimate relationship with how to grow many very different things. And I think that has put you in a place where you're examining the core of what 
that generative or syntropic principle is that creates something out of nothing and kind of drives everything forward. So I really like that idea of seeing that highest principle that keeps living things growing, maybe is the seed of consciousness as really a force rather than a personified. I, I guess in the process of developing as an artist, has that worldview been strengthened and, and come more and more into focus and kind of been reaffirmed? I'd say so, but whether that's that process or the process of growing up and having more experiences in your life, right. you know, things change so dramatically throughout time, but I've had the privilege of being really embedded in a natural environment the past decade and for most of my life. And I think when you see the systems operating, you see them changing in your lifetime and you get an idea of the histories that caused them and the relationships you can have to a place uh, directly to the land or to the history of the land and to the influences you can have in the future of the land. That has been really the driving forth force in my idea of ethics, my idea of respect and spirituality and place. Do you think people need to be exposed to more of those things? I mean, to get back to the land, get back to nature, to really activate them, to participate, like you were saying, to participate, to kind of bring us back into balance with nature and stop stressing our natural systems. Do you think step one might be exposure and having some of those experiences you've had? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Whether it's just, you know, a walk around the block, walk to the park, or if you can really get out there and experience something outside of a city, I think it can have such a therapeutic effect on you. And, you know, it really takes, it takes effort to do that. Uh, yeah. we live, we're very embedded in technology and me myself, it's very hard to put the cell phone down and really listen to, you know, what the birds sound like. And even though I'm here every day, it's not comfortable to be outside and rats and mosquitoes and all sort of awful things. There's mud everywhere, but getting over that and really, really finding a place within that, I think can give you a really valuable, really valuable experience that you can hold on to forever. Yeah. Yeah. And more and more, I see that as really the starting point of a solution. I mean, we're generations deep in getting lost in this human created system that's caused a lot of things to go out of balance. So it's going to take some time to figure out what the ways of life, what the systems of human society are going to look like that don't put us in a negative, you know, opposition to nature systems. And it feels to me like those steps of, of doing that, putting that effort forth or doing that work to get outside and further your own relationship with nature, it gets gradually easier and easier over time. You know, for me, I was someone who worked in an office building for a long time, was in urban settings. And it took some effort to push myself to get out into nature, go on more walks around the block. But gradually, you kind of start making that change. And it has that natural effect where it makes you start thinking more and more about these things and start thinking more and more about your place relative to nature and what you're doing that's supporting it or what you're doing that isn't supporting it. And, you know, it may take a couple generations to really get us back to a place where people are having more of those experiences, having more of their own relationship with nature that then creates this fertile ground for new ideas to pop up, new solutions, new ways of structuring systems. So people are thriving, but also it's keeping us in harmony with nature. And, you know, I think your journey and your story really illustrates that. And I think it's something that we all can do for ourselves you know we can all put ourselves on that journey or on that path that starts charting a new course to maybe improving society's relationship with nature uh, big big ideas but i think like most things the initial starting point for the solutions are are simple if you know what direction you have to go yeah i think that's a really good uh, statement
so people can find you. Uh, where can people see your work? Are you showing in any galleries or is it mostly online, social media? I mean, where can people find your art and learn more about you? I think the most updated spot is going to be my Instagram account. And that's uh, Chris Ritson, R-I-T-S-O-N. I have been really appreciating using the internet as an outlet to share this stuff. It really is the amazing, amazing thing, I think, for the mushroom community. And like I say, I learned everything I learned off of these resources. And I'd like to share everything I'm learning as well. Uh, there's, you know, no requirement on a financial system to support it in the gallery. Uh, there's nothing like that with the internet. So truly, I think a lot of this work I'm making for the internet and its physical existence is probably living things will probably always stay in Hawaii right now because of quarantine laws. Unless I were to grow it outside, uh, I do have a way of preserving them under a vacuum with uh, beeswax, actually. But right now, with everything going on in the world, I'm not engaged in any galleries. Uh, currently, I'm not represented by any either. But I am here. I'm hold, held up in this house, and I do have a lot of new work coming. So say follow me on Instagram if you want to uh, learn anything about what's happening. And I think if you're a mushroom lover, it's pretty much required following because <laughs> it's amazing stuff that I'm always excited to see when it pops up on my feed. So definitely get out there and follow Chris. And then you had sent over some information about the flower side of things that you're doing. Can people also find your flower business and or any information about the reforestation project or some of these other projects online? Yeah, uh, that is through our account called Tantalus Botanicals. And if you're interested in Hawaii history and tropical flowers and contemporary design, that's what that's all about. Uh, we've been able to dive really deep into the history of the mountain we live on, which has an incredible history from being deforested to being an experimental agriculture station. Uh, in the Victorian times, late 1800s, there were strange people living up here there's just so much going on. But if you're interested in that all, we grow heliconias, gingers, and costas. And it's another passion I have, definitely, is being able to bring things like flowers into people's life, where the art can be pretty critical. Uh, flowers bring ha nothing but happiness, I find. It's a really wonderful experience for us. Yeah, and it fits right into line with your goal of propagating the planet with all manner of living things. Uh, so uh -huh. I, I definitely am, encourage people to follow along there too. Is some, there's nothing better than tropical flowers and experiencing that, you know, whether it be through the internet interface, it doesn't, doesn't lose that awe-inspiring quality. Are there any future plans we should know about? I know right now is kind of a hard time to, for people to plan the future. And you said you have some new work coming out. Any other future plans, anything else we, we should know about that you got in the works? Maybe some 60-foot-tall bismuth sculptures? Well, like I say, I just built this new laminar flow hood. So I can. I am working now to get a very definitive protocol with how these grow, You know exactly how long they take uh, under a more professional setting. And then I hope to collaborate with some of the established farms here and do larger, more legitimate sort of and larger pieces, but also work with some of the more delicate mushrooms I've been using. But definitely, I just want to expand size. I, I want, you know, massive pieces that are larger than, you know, the viewers. Yeah, imagine a whole wall of a room or something covered in those beautiful turkey tails or those orange pycnoporous. Right, yeah. I think just the exploration of, you know, ornamental mushrooms is something I'd like to see happening. And whether we're selling them at the florist or, you know, in an art gallery, it's something I just hope to be able to bring to more people as uh, mycology becomes a lot more part of the public discourse. And have you ever dabbled or thought of dabbling in, in myco materials, uh, making furniture, that kind of thing with mushrooms? Because you have such great experience doing it. And a lot of the strains you're mentioning seem to be good for, for use as myco materials. Yeah, well, I absolutely consider this a myco material. And yeah. Instead, the, the entire canvas is held together. It is, uh, you know, a giant block of sawdust and mycelium. It doesn't need, it needs maybe some screws screwed into the back to hang on the wall, but 
the idea was to create an actual art object that is a material. And we are working on the flower side with uh, creating material that can be a replacement to floral foams. You've mm -hmm. ever gotten an arrangement and seen that green foam they stick the flowers into, which yeah. by the way is used by the ton in the wedding industry. Uh, we are working on a foam alternative made out of mushrooms and agricultural waste. So I'd really like to see that developed as a successful mico material. It'd be great for Hawaii. It would be great for environment everywhere. And stuff's made out of a formaldehyde resin. Uh, it's a Ooh. yeah, it's a polymer, but it's also particularly toxic. The dust so it does put florists at a big risk who work with it regularly. Wow. Hopefully, we're gonna find more and more things like that. You know, I never thought of the foam at the base of flowers, but you're in that industry, so you would. Hopefully, we'll find more and more creative applications like that. It really is so exciting. Why so many of us, like yourself, see mushrooms as such a big part of the future at really putting us in a better balance with nature. So that's that's fantastic. I hope that project comes into being, and I hope you find some more things we can replace instead of uh, formaldehyde derivatives. Mushrooms do have a lot of potential for you know helping as long as a uh, human culture. And I think this podcast here is a really good example how you're creating a community of people just about a subject that has really wonderful ramifications for the people listening to it and the thoughts you're sharing. So I want to thank you for that too. Oh, well, thank you. It wouldn't be possible without interesting people doing amazing things with mushrooms that are willing to come on and the hope is that it will spark and get some people interested get people talking and who knows the person who's going to come up with that next great application of mycelium uh, may not know about mushrooms yet maybe they just need to hear about it so a couple final thoughts i had the first one is always tough for people and it's i'm not asking for a favorite but what's a mushroom that you love and why should we know about it this could change in five minutes, but just one you can think of that you love and, and that we should know about. Uh, I know I already addressed it, but the Mycoporus affinis is really, really my favorite right now. And I think you should know about it as a biomaterial. Uh, yeah. It is maybe not the sturdy, maybe not the uh, most aggressive compared to things like a turkey tail or a Ganoderma, but it is definitely structurally the strongest I've come across. It seems to have relationships with algae as it grows, which I think is very interesting. And it hasn't been studied very much, but it does have a pretty rich potential for medicinal value. And it does have a cultural usage in Southeast Asia, but also it's absolutely one of the most beautiful mushrooms I've found. And I know through Instagram, the photos I'm having be shared the most is this mushroom. And it's just immediately people respond to it. and. I think there's a lot of reasons, not just that it's beautiful looking, but does have a lot of potential for us all. That's tremendous. I had never heard of that mushroom before. So definitely adding that to my list. That's the secret reason why I ask everyone about mushrooms they love is so I can make a bigger list of all the mushrooms I love and need to know about. Uh, now, what, what advice, given your journey, your life experience, what advice would you give to an 18-year-old Chris? <laughs> Um, gosh, if you would, if you would even listen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. I think when I was 18, I really was eager to get out of Hawaii. And, you know, I think I grew up here feeling kind of at odds with the culture and feeling like I was maybe would be more appreciated in the city or something in the mainland. But very clearly, I real very soon I realized how important Hawaii is and the identity I had was totally dependent on the time I'd spent here. So I just kind of wish I didn't lose track of that for that short period of time. And I'd always really accounted for how much this place meant to me and that I should be involving my practice in that sense of place all the time. But it's hard because I don't regret any of that time I spent outside of Hawaii and it was very fundamental to my uh, development. Well, I think that's, that's a good takeaway for anyone is to remember the importance of place and remember the influences of a land and of an ecology on your development and not dismiss it or see it as lesser and realize it has its its important place even if it's not so vivid and teeming with life as as hawaii definitely remember to the importance of place now with all of your work that you're doing 
which is vast and regenerative and just really inspiring. Uh, what is the lasting impact that you hope to make with this with this whole body of work? Well, personally, I'm hoping to come to a better standing of the bridge between myself and the other, everything that's outside of me, the world, nature, uh, death, being born. And through studying that myself, I hope to offer that influence to people too, to use this as a tool to explore larger subjects that we, re we reach for throughout history with art and with religion. And that I believe is a bridge and that bridge I'm hoping maybe just to set some steps forward. I can never make it. I'm not sure, but I think my integration with the art world needs to account for the importance of Hawaii, uh, the relevance and specificity of the art I'm making here, but also offer that bridge to people around the world. What you just described and helping reconcile that relation between our personal ego or consciousness or self and reconciling that relationship to the other, you know, that's at the heart of all the quote unquote great works that you hear about through ancient mystery schools. And that is this idea that since the beginning of time, we've been trying to reconcile and develop a better relationship with the other and ultimately see that, you know, maybe we're all one. Uh, so you hope to, yeah. I think that impact you hope to make is probably the most important impact throughout time. So that's terrific. Well, Chris, I thank you again for being so magnanimous with your time, with sharing your answers, really thought provoking stuff and uh, just a really high level of, of conversation. And it's really exciting to see what you do with mushrooms. So thank you so much for being part of the Mushroom Hour. Thank you. I'm very grateful for the experience.